Welcome to Oil City, Pennsylvania. Located at the confluence of the Allegheny River and Oil Creek in Venango County, Oil City is an area rich in history and local pride. Join us as residents show and tell everything that makes their community a great hometown. I'm Neil Mack. We and uh, I'm here to talk about the early days of oil, oil history on Oil Creek and on the Allegheny River and the transportation of crude out of the area. Oil was transported initially on Oil Creek by these crude barges at the very beginning of 1860 uh, after the ice melted. Um, the first steamboats from Pittsburgh who came up to capture that oil and take it down river to P the refineries in Pittsburgh, they arrived at the mouth of Oil Creek in 1861. The, the, not all the oil went down by steamboat. Steamboats would tow it down, but some of that oil was also stored here in Oil City by a group called the Oil City Shippers. And the shippers were businessmen who were just buying uh, the crude at a low price here on the river, waiting and then to sell it later in the year to get a better price in Pittsburgh at the refineries. And they built up to, there were 11, beg your pardon, there were 21 of these shippers and their facilities along the Allegheny River, just around the corner at the mouth. And these folks were the ones who actually established the early commercial activity here in Oil City and around oil, and it grew from that. When bringing the uh, crew down the creek in these barges, yes, most of the time it went well, obviously. Uh, they wouldn't keep doing it. It sure beat the wagons. The wagons were uh, the alternative, and this was a much better way to bring it down the creek. However, occasionally there were some wrecks uh, in these on the creek. The creek had to be raised. The water level had to be raised, and this is, it created a man-made flood called a freshet. The freshet was not original to the oil industry. This was something the lumber industry had been doing for 30 years or so around here. But all it was was damming water up the creek. There were four or five dams up the creek that did it and they would pay the owners, the landowners, to dam this water um, behind their dams. And then uh, at a certain time, there'd be a, uh, an announcement, we're going to have a freshet, a man-made freshet, which they did. And those guys, those guys who owned the dams up there, they were all paid about 300 bucks a piece to actually let the water out and come down the creek. And when it came down the creek, the water raised and it got deep enough for the heavily laden barges, which were full of oil now, either barrels of oil or bulk, it got deep enough for them to move out onto the creek, catch the wave, if you will, if you think about surfing, that sort of thing, catch the wave, and literally ride the wave down here, all the way down here to Oil City at the mouth. Normally, like I said, it went well, but there were, there were occasions it was an absolute disaster. To set up what the Oil City oil exchange was about. You have to understand how the gathering pipelines came into existence and what role they played. The, the gathering pipelines were literally two inch pipes that were strung out all over the oil producing region, which originally brought uh, the oil to the, uh, to the railroad so that the railroads could take it out of here. That's how it was done. And the pipeline companies issued receipts, paper receipts, which were called oil certificates. These oil certificates could be bought and sold in the Oil City Oil Exchange. And that's what happened. This is how they created the market for it. This is how they created the price for it. This place became by the 18, late 1870s. In 1877, for example, the New York paper said this was the third largest trading center in the country of all commodities and all goods. The third largest one behind only New York City and um, San Francisco. So that was all done on the exchange. They did so well, they built themselves a new building in 1878, real handsome one. And it lasted for about, uh, as an exchange, it lasted for about 20 years. And as a building, it lasted for maybe 45 years and they had to take it down. But this was the center of activity among the wealthy men in this area. That's how they bought and sold the crude. They had brokers also in the exchange. You had to pay to be on the exchange. You had to pay 300 bucks initially, which was an awful lot of money to be a member to be a member, but it's the only way you could stand around the bull ring and bid and, and to buy the, the crude. But that, that's what happened on the exchange. The Oil City Exchange became the leading oil exchange in the country. It set the price of crude for the entire world in the late 1870s and the early 1880s. And the men who were involved in obviously did very, very well. 
Oil City was a very wealthy city in the late 19th century, actually remained so into the early 20th century, and that oil exchange activity had an awful lot to do with that. My name is Gary Dittman, and my story is about theater in the local area and the community playhouse development. Theater has been around and alive in our area since the very beginning. Uh, in the 1800s, lumber was the economic development force in the area, but then came oil, and oil changed everything. It permeated the area. It covered everything. Towns um, actually grew up overnight, boom towns like Pit Hole. Uh, and they all uh, made money for folks, not just the speculators, but it made money for the inventors, the bankers, the restauranteurs, uh, the tool men, the people that hauled the oil, the teamsters, um, but there were theaters. In Pit Hole, it was only around for two or three years, there were three large active theaters. The largest one was the Murphy's Theater that seated 1,100 residents. Well, just like the oil washed down Oil Creek to Oil City, so did the theaters um, and the money that came from oil. Uh, it built lavish homes and businesses in the town, and it built lots of theaters, and they flourished. Uh, vaudeville was very, very active at the time, and we were on the circuit uh, pulling in acts from the bigger towns like Baltimore and New York and Pittsburgh. People had money and they had time and they wanted to be entertained. So they went to the theater. Uh, and there were lots of theaters around. Theaters like uh, Love's Music Hall, the Orpheum, the Princess, the Cameo, the Venango, the Temple, the Star, the Majestic, Verbex, Plaza, all, uh, all operating in Little Oil City. Uh, eventually, the theaters moved from uh, live theater to uh, moving pictures and then to talking. And uh, those theaters changed with the times. But in 1955, there was a group of people that got together. They were um, just regular folks like you and me, um, businessmen, salesmen, teachers, housewives that banded together and made a corporation called Community Playhouse Inc. in 1955. Their first uh, production was The Father of the Bride and it was produced at the Oil City High School which was then on the corner of Spring and Graff Streets. And from then on they did two or three shows, three or four shows a year. One of uh, uh, CPI did shows, um, like I said, three or four a year and uh, most of them were their own shows. But during the period of uh, 1992 to 1995, uh, the biggest accomplishment might have been uh, the operation of the Drake Theater, which was uh, a movie house that was constructed in 1926. Uh, it was uh, an Art Deco uh, theater that seated uh, 900 on the main floor and about 250 on the, on the uh, balcony. And we operated that for two and a half years. Uh, we did about a dozen shows of our own there and brought dozens of other shows in. Uh, Trinity Boys Choir from England, um, uh, many of the schools brought shows in to do there. Uh, we did kids shows. And it, we were ready with uh, the volunteer labor to get it cleaned up and operate it and purchase the, the building. But we lost the building at tax sale. So fast forward now to 2015, Community Playhouse is um, celebrating their 60th year of performing, uh, uh, three or four shows a year, and uh, they are launching a project to reclaim one of the, the early vaudeville theaters that's left, the only vaudeville theater that's left in the area, uh, the former uh, Air Dome uh, Princess, Cameo, Orpheum, and the uh, Lyric. It also was a men's clothing store uh, uh, 
till about um, from 1955 to 1980 or so. And now they're going to uh, redesign that back into a theater like it was uh, in 1926 when it was the uh, Lyric. Hi, my name is Trenton Mullen. I'm the executive director of the Oil City Civic Center and uh, Na uh, Bridge Builders Community Foundations in Oil City, Pennsylvania, and we'll be talking about the National Transit Building Complex today. The National Transit Building was built in 1890, and um, the National Transit Building Annex was built in 1896, six years later. Uh, the main building is, uh, was built for the tune of $90,000, uh, which is about two million in today's money, uh, but even with two million in today's money, we could never come close to how much uh, detail and beautiful woodwork and marble and brass and entranceways are here now. Um, the National Transit Building was created in 1990, well, not the building, but the, uh, the current owners, which is the Oil City Civic Center, which is a 501c3 nonprofit was uh, given the building complex by Ralph Nader in 1999 in his Institute for Civic Renewal. And uh, that mission is to provide uh, nonprofit spaces for, or affordable nonprofit spaces for nonprofits that serve the local area, but also preserve the building and make sure that its historic character is preserved for generations to come. And throughout that, uh, we now house 11 nonprofits we also have two for-profits, uh, so our main focus is giving that affordable space so that they can uh, to nonprofits so that they can build their capacity. And uh, down the road, and this is kind of what I call my bee hog, which is a big, hairy, outrageous goal, is to have a nonprofit shared service center um, so that we can help uh, enable the capacity of those nonprofits to better serve the people here in the Venango County area. Um, part of uh, the, the giving back of the, of the National Transit Building does is that it provides a space for uh, the local arts revitalization program. And uh, currently there are about 20 spaces uh, for artists uh, that have their studios and they could, they could be painters, they could be sculptors, they can be photographers, there's a whole slew of them. Uh, all kinds of different media and that sort of thing and it, I really appreciate it because I'm not artistic so um, but they also we also have the uh, Transit Fine Arts Gallery which is a beautiful gallery that you can go into and actually purchase items we have the Oil Valley Center for the Arts where they provide classes uh, for whether it's photography or painting or all kinds of different things like that uh, we also have the Graffiti Gallery which has kind of I don't know how often, I bet it would be every other month a new opening with new, with new uh, pieces that are hung and it's a fun time to uh, look at new art that's uh, down in that gallery and it's, they usually have wine and cheese and that sort of thing and it's a good time to see everybody. And, uh, you really feel like you're in Manhattan, not Oil City. And um, soon uh, there, there will be a pottery studio, hopefully, in the basement of the annex and uh, we're getting on the home stretch there. And, a lot of planning and a lot of work has gone into that and I think very soon uh, we should have a pottery studio where uh, people can learn how to throw some pots on the wheels and put them in kilns and all that so and as I said I'm not artistic so all that stuff I really appreciate because I definitely can't do that so throughout the year there are concerts in what we call the great room and uh, the great room is a large room it used to be where Mr. Seep who was the the old guy that ran the place. Uh, it used to be his office. Now, if I ever have an office this big, I'll tell you what, it's gonna be nuts, but it's, it's about 90 feet long and about 20 feet wide. Uh, but now it has concerts uh, in it, and they also have community meetings and all these different things in that room. Uh, but we also have on Wednesdays at lunchtime throughout the summer, we have concerts in Pipeline Alley. Pipeline Alley is the space between the main building and the annex and it uh, has a little stage on it, the local gardening club, they fix it up every springtime, and there's a little stage and have little acoustic uh, shows every Wednesday for lunch, and uh, it's, it's a very nice setting. Hi, 
my name is George Cooley, and I'm here today to talk about Rushing to the Canvas, which is an exhibit uh, here in Oil City for Dr. Edward Kuhlman, who is a Lutheran minister, but also a painter all his life. And uh, he left town in 1956 uh, and died in 1973. So part of the story is uh, how we collected all his paintings and uh, put the exhibit together. Uh, Edward Kuhlman was born in 1883 and uh, in Wisconsin and he went to the Chicago Art Institute for uh, art school and then did some further art school in, uh, in, in uh, Philadelphia and uh, then somewhere along the line something changed and he decided to become a Lutheran minister and uh, the beautiful thing is that he kept kept painting his entire life and uh, he was a very busy man he wrote a lot of books he uh, ran a church of 500 people so i'm sure that was a very full-time job uh, but painted all the time and that's that's where my interest in him is um, and how i found out about him was that uh, he was a he had a habit of every time he married a couple that he'd give them a painting. And my mother-in-law mother ended up being one of those brides. He, he worked with watercolors and oils, gouache, which is a type of, of watercolor. And uh, he usually worked on scene and did a lot of landscapes. He did some portrait work. Um, he, uh, but I think most of the time he was actually at the location that he was painting, so they were realistic places. But he had a habit of not dating his work and not titling it. So there's a lot of, a lot of his work that's of a place, but I don't know where it is. My name is Father Justin Pino, and uh, I'll be speaking about the story of uh, St. Joseph's Church here in Oil City. Well, shortly after the discovery of oil in Titusville, and this whole region really began to boom, obviously workers of various ethnic groups, many of them Catholic, needed a place to worship. So shortly in the early 1860s, they started to have masses in basically people's homes or the, over the, you know, over grocery stores, anywhere they could find. And by 1862, 1863, they decided, well, we need to build a building. And Father David Snively, who was the founding pastor of St. Joseph's, was actually a convert from Lutheranism. So he was brought up Lutheran, but converted to Catholicism. And he established St. Joseph's and built the first church, a small wooden structure on Pearl Avenue in 1864, which was known then as Cottage Hill, which overlooked the city. It was very smart to do so because it was a perfect location to overlook the city on the hill, also safe from flooding. Um, but that proved with the population explosion following the Civil War. Uh, it's interesting to know that my congregation began when Abraham Lincoln was president of the United States. It's interesting how those connections find themselves. And uh, by 1890, it was obvious, so it wasn't even 30 years later. They needed a much larger church. And enters probably one of the most legendary figures in Oil City or the Catholic Church here in Oil City is Thomas Carroll. Father Carroll was actually a Holy Cross father, which are the priests that run Notre Dame University in South Bend, Indiana. He became ill and decided to go into the country to live more, more healthier, I suppose. And so he made his way to Oil City. And in 1890, he chose to build the magnificent double spire church that overlooks Oil City now, which is St. Joseph's. It cost $100,000 to build the church in 1890, in 1890 they began. So 125 years ago, uh, this May, he broke ground for the new church. It took four years to build. So the church has been in its present position overlooking Oil City for 120 years. Of that $100,000, which is about $3 million in today's money, it was mostly his own money. 
He had cashed in on oil early. He was very smart, had a business acumen very well. He owned property up and down the East Coast. So it, it was only out of his own pocket he built that church, which I don't think you could build today with all the hand-carved pews and all the beautiful appointments and the marble. and It would just be astronomical. They don't teach those kind of skills any longer uh, to people, but in four years, it just it just rose up into the skyline and uh, whether you're Catholic or not Catholic or just visiting Oil City, it's the first thing you see. In any direction in this place, you see St. Joseph, those twin towers just towering over uh, the, the, the skyline. It's, it's quite magnificent and, uh, and I, I feel very humbled that I, I live in the home that both Father Carroll and Bishop McManaman lived in. Their, their spirits and all the priests and the sisters and the people that have been there at Pearl Avenue for the last 150 years, they're still there. Their spirits certainly pervade the space. They're part of the mortar and the bricks. They built the place and it's, it's quite beautiful. And Father Carroll, as I said, who built the church, specifically put in his will that he wished to be buried under the north tower of the church, the tower closest to his home, the rectory where I live in. So that request was granted in 1898. He only lived to four more years after the church was completed. Um, I'm sure it weighed heavily on him physically and mentally to build a magnificent structure like that. But he was buried there in 1898, and there was a memorial plaque placed in the wall. And a number of years ago, uh, I decided not many people, especially our visitors, realize he is buried there. Even some of my own parishioners didn't realize he was buried underneath the floor in the basement. There was a way to get to the tomb, but it was quite cumbersome through holes. and. It wasn't a very dignified pl resting place for him, but that's where he wanted to be buried. So uh, about three years ago, we cut through the floor, the exact same s cuts that were used to bury him in 1898, and we installed a plexiglass, actually it's a bulletproof glass floor. It's all lit now, the chamber, and his, the sarcophagus was repainted in a beautiful bronze cross placed on it. It's all lit uh, with burgundy curtains around the tomb, so you can see his tomb from the upper level of the church now much more dignified. It's probably, if I'm not mistaken, one of the only open tombs in a church outside of Europe, at least in the Diocese of Erie, that you can see the tomb. So it's, when we have visitors come, it's quite the uh, tourist attraction, if you can put it that way, so people can see. So he never wanted to leave the church because he loved, the, he loved it so much that, like I said, he gave his own money and it, he truly built a magnificent house to God, and that house has been there now for 120 years. My name is Sherry, and my story is about education in the Oil City area. From the research that I've done, the first high school was built in 1877. The first graduating class was 1878, and it had 16 students. By the 1970s, the population had grown so that through the 70s, graduating classes were over 300. Um, it has fallen since then, and we're down to between 150 and 170 students in a graduating class now. At one time in Oil City, there were 14 elementary schools and three parochial schools. Uh, now we have four elementary schools and one parochial school and one Catholic high school. Oil City being a blue collar town, um, naturally most of the people went into the oil and gas industry here uh, and affiliated trades. But as early as 1899, Welch's Business School opened and continued through the early part of the century till about 1950. Um, <clears throat> Oil City Business School then seems to have picked up at the same location and continued through the 1970s. Uh, there was also a nursing school affiliated with the Oil City um, Hospital, so those were two options for people with, uh, with training after high school. In 1961, Venango campus of Clarion State College came to Oil City 
and that first year they had uh, they had classes in the Odd Fellows building. Uh, and in 1962, Frame Hall, the first permanent building of Venango campus, was built on the present location of Venango College, which Venango campus became Venango College in 2014. It now has four buildings and three uh, dormitory buildings, or four, three residence halls uh, with plans for more and they have grown from two majors to, I don't even know, I think about 45 now at Venango campus. Uh, the other option was Du Bois Business College and that came to Oil City in 1996. They were asked to come here because Quaker State Penn's Oil were relocating to Texas and that left a large number of unemployed people that were looking for other jobs and needed retrained. Du Bois Business College itself started in 1885. Annie Oakley was in the headlines, Grover Cleveland was president, and the Statue of Liberty had just arrived in New York Harbor when we started our school. I'm Debbie Sabina. I'm Director of Finance and Administration for the Venango College of Clarion University. Excited to be here to tell you the story of one of the greatest amenities in the Oil City or surrounding Venango County area. It is the West End Pond. It is the gateway, really, of the west entrance to the city of Oil City. It is a naturally occurring pond. A lot of people might not know that when they take a look at it and see it with its amenities, but we know it was enjoyed as a destination point since the early 1890s. Uh, families on weekends would visit the pond, throw out a blanket, and have a picnic there. It was located very close to the trolley bed that ran from the city to Monarch Park, um, which was uh, a beautiful amusement park in its time. And so really from there, you have over a century of families um, enjoying the pond for a number of reasons. Picnics, fishing, skating. The campus did not always own the pond or dam. Um, I, I believe it had typically in recent years been part of the city footprint. And then it was transferred to the Commonwealth when Venango campus was developed in 1961. So that's how we came to be the owners of that particular property. Um, it, we do have challenges with uh, large rain events pulling silt down through the valley into the pond. So uh, again, we um, try to be good stewards and, and take care of it for all of the community to enjoy, not just our students, but really everyone um, who, who considers it their pond it really is everybody's pond. It's not just part of the campus. Um, so we do have to do dredge projects. This is a year for a dredge project, and it's pretty invasive. We do a drawdown, and we have to excavate and, and remove the silt, but we promise to put it back the way it was. And what that means is, uh, you know, the, the fish habitat will be restored, and it will be used for fishing and some people still skate, not too many, not as many as they used to, but we have some, some wonderful shots of over the years how people have used the pond for these types of activities. Everybody uh, uses the pond in ways um, that have really kind of woven it into the fabric of their lives here. Many prom pictures, many, um, I want to say there have been many weddings there, some that we know about and some that we don't daily dog walks. Um, I will even say we have some daily uh, fisher people. <laughs> I mean, some people come down every single night just to take a walk around the pond, maybe cast a line with their children. So it's, uh, it, it, we welcome users um, from anywhere to come in and, and just enjoy it. And uh, we're always receptive to ideas for improvements.
I'm Susan Williams. I'm the Executive Director of the Venango Area Chamber of Commerce. I'm doing my story about our origin as the Oil City Area Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce was established in 1912. A small group of men joined together believing that through cooperation that they could promote the community and make uh, ensure the sustainability of Oil City. That small group grew quickly. Um, the first official meeting, there were over 30 men there. I, I think it's notable that there were probably all men at that time. And they began as a board of trade, but realized quickly that that was a mouthful to be the Oil City Board of Trade and decided to settle on Chamber of Commerce. They modeled their first bylaws after Williamsport, Pennsylvania and quickly set to planning how they would promote the community. And the th things that they were concentrating on in those early days were indeed promotion. They began finding ways to celebrate what was going on in the community and to solve problems. They were working on floods and unemployment and city streets, anything that might hold back business. They concentrated on the oil industry and promoting that and attracting those businesses that were related to the oil industry. The early chamber was essential to helping people work together in the community. They were the group that were influential um, in solving problems. They often lobbied not only locally, but would take trips to Harrisburg and Washington, even when travel was hard, to advocate for issues that affected business, from taxes to roads to education, uh, and have continued to be um, an advocate for education from 1912 until today. Um, one of the problems that has been existing since those early days is unemployment, and the Chamber has always taken an active role in how to minimize unemployment, and of course education has been a key factor in that. At the time of the 75th anniversary, the Executive Director of the Oil City Chamber of Commerce was Leighton Matchelet. He had previously been a school administrator, and he suggested having a contest to find a new slogan for Oil City. The winner of that contest was Steve Pickna, who was at the current time the superintendent of schools. And Steve knew that we indeed had a diverse population and played on the special blend of oils. Uh, there were three prominent oil companies at the time and suggested that slogan be Oil City, a special blend of people. And that slogan stayed for many, many years and reflected, uh, again, not only the diverse population, but the significance of the oil industry in Oil City. In the early 2000s, the board of directors of the Oil City Chamber had become very diverse, and many of the businesses actually represented businesses that serve a larger community. And they began to think about how they might act as a regional chamber. Uh, there was an existing business organization in Cranberry, and the effort became um, active to merge organizations and ended up with a consolidation of the two organizations in 2005 and a rebranding as the Venango Area Chamber of Commerce. The, today's Venango Area Chamber of Commerce is indeed a regional chamber serving businesses throughout the county. We still have over 200 businesses who have a Oil City address, so we have a significant presence here and are very active in the Oil City community but the businesses that our members um, represent an entire region, and we serve that region now. Over the years, there have been a number of slogans that the Chamber has adopted, uh, a community we can be proud of, a catalyst for progress, and one I was particularly interested in was keep pace with tomorrow, and that continues to be a real focus of the Chamber, to keep pace with the future. Uh, I'm proud to be part of an organization that has always been looking for ways to be efficient in using technology and looking to see where our markets will go and looking for ways to help our members so that we are able to prosper into the future. Hi, I'm Betsy Kellner and today I'm going to talk about the Venango Museum. This building was built in 1905. It was a, called a federal building, and it was originally built to be United States Post Office. It had two expansions, 
and it was used as a post office until the 1960s. When they decided not to use the, muse the building as a post office anymore, um, several people got on uh, the co county commissioners. They, the federal government decided to give the building to the county. So right away they got on the county commissioners and they said we need to make this building a museum. There was a small building in Franklin that was used for the Venango Museum and it was too small. They decided it needed to be a bigger building and this was the perfect building for it. So a group of, of local businessmen got together, said they would do the work, they would get the building ready, and they wanted it to be a museum. And it was, opened its doors in 1985 for the first exhibit as a museum. Um, in the exhibits, in the early exhibits, it was always a changing um, exhibit area and a changing museum. And they would just depend on local people to bring in their collections. They had a wonderful, uh, there's a great Polish history here in Old City. And they had a wonderful Polish exhibit. They had um, Christmas exhibits that would fill up the whole building with people's displays of Christmas Santa Clauses and items in that nature. But they would really depend on the community to bring the items in to use for exhibiting. And that is um, why then the decision was made to turn it over into a permanent exhibit. And that is what happened when we became the exhibit that's here now, which is oil, black gold or black magic, which is an exhibit that asks you the question, what does the discovery of oil still do to affect your lives today? When we decided to turn the, build, to turn the museum into a permanent exhibit, the building needed some extensive work. And one thing that happened was uh, completely redoing the floors. The floors are the original floors, but they were able to have a company come in and sand them and bring them up to their previous glory. Uh, a lot of the building is um, got marble in it, and it's just a very exciting building to be in. A couple of the exhibits that have been here almost the entire time the building has been here is the 1928 Wurlitzer Theater organ. There was a theater across town called the Latonia Theater, and this organ was made specifically for the Latonia to play with silent movies. Unfortunately, it was made at the end of the silent movie era and right before the Great Depression, so the theater never really caught on as a big theater, but people here locally remember going on their first date, getting engaged. The theater just meant everything to them. Another item we have is a 1937 Cord Fanton automobile. Cord Fantons were only made from 1937 to 1945 because they were just a little too expensive for people to buy. And we do have a completely original Cord Fanton here in our museum. And we show it to the, the students that come through as tours to explain to them how um, that's when cars were pretty new and they would, everybody would jump in the car on Sunday afternoon and go for a Sunday afternoon picnic. I think it's very important that there's a museum in Oil City because people know Oil City, they hear that name and they automatically think of oil. When they come to Oil City, they want to learn about oil. So they come in and they say, we are here to learn about oil. And this is a way to have that available to them at one location. We are also the local visitor center, so they can stop in, check out what else is around, and learn about oil while they're here. My name is Ron Black, and today I want to talk to you about our Oil Heritage Festival. 37 years ago, I was the vice president of the Chamber of Commerce, and we made the decision at that time that we thought we ought to celebrate our oil heritage. Uh, we also thought uh, if we had a festival, it would bring foot traffic into our downtown. Uh, we were starting to lose some businesses, and we really needed to do something. When we started, we were very fortunate to have two major oil companies in town, Penn's Oil and Quaker State, and they were very, very benevolent sponsors. Today, our sponsorship falls on our businesses and individuals. Uh, the festival was started, uh, it was a week-long festival, and uh, it was pretty simple, but we had different events for children and adults, and our, our game was to try to bring people from out of town to come and celebrate with us. Uh, one of our desires was to try to make everything as free as we could. Uh, we had events that we basically divided into two categories, children's and adults. Uh, they were activities that uh, 
would somehow lead people to lean, uh, learn more about the oil industry. So it was a little difficult to not just have a festival. We wanted to have a festival, but at the same time be highlighting our oil heritage. Yeah, the events that uh, I think stand out to me that have endured for the 37 years, we have one called Fun Fair for the children. We start off with a children's parade and uh, they have different categories like cartoon characters, oil industry characters. Uh, we have pool party. We, we have a pet show. For the adults, we have a three-hour parade on Saturday, uh, about 50 units, and uh, we also have flex uh, uh, young adults in this area play frisbee. So we have a frisbee tournament and a disc tournament. Uh, we have things like arm wrestling. Uh, a number of the concerts are geared toward the adults. Uh, we, we have on Saturday night our main concert, and we end that with a fireworks spectacular. We were able to support a week-long festival for a number of years. In about 2007, I think it was, uh, we had lost major sponsors, and uh, it was hard to get volunteers. Employees are pretty busy at their businesses because they've been cut back. Uh, so we decided to downsize to a four-day festival. We jam a lot into those four days. Uh, the other thing we do is we involve high school kids. Uh, we select a queen, and we have three schools in the area that provide candidates. The students vote for the queen, and then she's utilized during the year by the Chamber of Commerce uh, as kind of a goodwill ambassador. Well, when I first came to town, uh, we started the festival, like I said, and one of our key characters is Colonel Drake. He was instrumental in discovering oil and he had a big top hat and you know long tailed coat. Well the kids in school thought it was Abraham Lincoln. So after a few years they found out who Colonel Drake was and I think it's important that they know their heritage, you know why we're named Oil City and uh, what the oil industry did to develop this area and as I said it's also something that we hope is going to bring people into our downtown to share it with us. Hi, my name is Marge Kahn. I'm a member of the Bell Letras Club. It's a group of women uh, who organized with the intent of having a library in the city. They met together back in 1888, uh, studied Shakespeare, uh, drew up a constitution, uh, became incorporated, and started a library of their own. The Belletris Club is the oldest women's civic club in Oil City as well as the state of Pennsylvania. After they became uh, chartered and incorporated, they were able to start a library of their own, which they did start the library of their own. They collected books, but their main ambition was to have their own library. In 1899, they contacted Andrew Carnegie. They learned that he was giving money to different cities who he felt was qualified and they wrote and asked him if he would help support a library. He said that he wrote back, he gave them $500, and he said, I will help you out if you, for one, have a building site of your own, and two, if your city fathers would agree to maintain uh, the library no less than three thousand dollars a year. They started funds to to buy a lot for the library, so they did with the city fathers. They they raised money and uh, raised eleven thousand dollars that bought the library property on Central Avenue where it is today. The library was built, and in 1904 the library was completed, and the women of the club turned over all their books, 5,000 books plus, and that was the start of the Old City Library. At that time, it was called the Andrew Carnegie Library. The legacy is, is really exciting. Uh, the club 
in 2013 celebrated their 125th anniversary. And the, when the library opened up, the women of the club had a, a uh, library up on the second floor of, of the library. And they needed a home of their own because they were getting new membership and it, it grew. So there was a big, magnificent uh, Victorian home on West First Street where Henry McSweeney, who was uh, an executive of the um, National Transit Pipeline, had built, well, he didn't have the house built. The house was built in 1890 when we had the oil boom in Oil City. And uh, all these beautiful Victorian homes were built, and this was one of them. When Mr. McSweeney was traveling back and forth to Atlantic City, his home on West First Street was empty. Uh, at the time, Mrs. McGill was president, and she had her husband, attorney John McGill, write to Mr. McSweeney asking him if he could possibly, uh, would he possibly be interested in selling the house? And he wrote back after much correspondence that he felt that the women of Will City would, the city of Will City would benefit from this and he would bequeath the house to the women with one stipulation, it always remained a women's club. Number two, they had a, that it would have a music room and a library and be open to all the women of Will City and the surrounding areas. What's happening today is there for a while, after the big corporations left Oil City, our membership dropped dramatically. But the women uh, of the town are getting together. We are getting new members. Uh, people are using our beautiful establishment, our house. We built a, an auditorium back in 1929, a gorgeous auditorium. and. They paid for it. As a matter of fact, they uh, took out a loan for $26,000 to build this auditorium. And it was paid off in 1945, but uh, that was the only time Bell Edris ever took out a loan. They paid it off in 1945. Today, people are using our, our building and our auditorium for weddings, receptions, birthday parties. We recently had a beautiful uh, dinner theater with the Barrow Theater in Franklin. We are supporting a lot of the charitable organizations in Oil City and Franklin and Titusville. We are supporting uh, children's aid, family services groups, the Humane Society, the Salvation Army. Uh, we are going to do a scholarship this year for membership and their families. Uh, we continue to be the grand matriarch of that beautiful Victorian home. Hi, I'm Mark Elliston, and my story is about the history of Christ Episcopal Church and its part in Oil City. Well, the Episcopal Church in this area started in the 1860s. In the first years, we didn't have an actual church building. We met in rented halls like Bascom's Halls over in the Third Ward of Oil City. Father Reuben Nevius was the first priest that actually served a parish here, and he served parishes in Oil City and Ravsville. The church in Ravsville was actually the first one built. It was built in 1869. The church in Oil City was built in 1870, and it was a carpenter Gothic structure that stood where the Masonic Hall now stands on East First Street. The church in Ravsville was later disbanded, dismantled, sold to Bradford, where it was rebuilt as the Church of the Ascension. It burned down in 1890 in Bradford. It was rebuilt as an Episcopal church in Bradford. Uh, the original bell from the Ravsville church and the psalm board from the Ravsville church were actually given to Oil City, and they're still in use and on display in the Oil City church. The current church building we have was built in 1885. When the fire and flood occurred on June 5th, 1892, that happened to be the Feast of Pentecost, Whitsunday. 
and one of our parishioners leaving the church heard a commotion on the north side of Oil City. She went to the foot of Central Avenue where the church is located, and by that time, fire was already consuming the north side of Oil City. We didn't have a hospital at the time, so Christ Episcopal Church was one of the buildings that was used as a hospital ward during the fire and flood. We don't have too many details on the actual staffing of it. I'm sure some of the parishioners okay. served as, as aides there. They may have transported the more critically injured out of the area. I know our priest at the time, J.B. Brooks, uh, was very active in the, in the fire and flood and the recovery from it. And it actually, it actually broke his health. And I believe we had two parishioners that did pass away in the fire and flood. We built a new parish hall in 1905, and it was used as an overflow hospital ward during the Spanish influenza epidemic of 1917 and 1918. And there was a little bit of controversy afterwards uh, because of the influenza contamination as to who would be responsible for cleaning up the parish hall, whether that was the, the church or the city. Uh, the city eventually did pay for the cleanup and fumigation of the parish hall building. Uh, the church is a fantastic architectural piece. Uh, we have eight Tiffany windows in the church. One of those, as a matter of fact, is in memory of one of our congregation members that passed away in the Spanish influenza epidemic, Helen Splane Berry. Uh, the companion window to that is dedicated to her brother, Alvin Splane, who was a World War I Air Force veteran. And those windows stand on either side of the uh, signed Lewis Comfort Tiffany Ascension window, which are really all spectacular windows. Probably my, my greatest involvement these days in the Oil City community is undoubtedly with the church, with my ministry work over there because the, the church, while it's a wonderful Gothic revival structure designed by the same fellow that designed the building we're in right now, as a matter of fact, an architect from Fredonia, New York, it's also still an active part of the community and that's what's most important, that the, the church is there and still serving the people of Oil City as it should be. My name is Sam Gordon, and I'm doing my story on the history of radio in Oil City. The first radio station in Oil City was also the first one in Venango County, and it was WKRZ, and it went on the air on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1947. And um, it was on top of uh, Rich Hill at Orange Street, 746 Orange Street. and supposedly, although I can't really document this fact, but the original metal building may have come from a Sears Roebuck catalog, okay? And the tower, which looks like the Eiffel Tower behind that building that is still standing up there, was constructed by a company out of Pittsburgh called Blonox for $3,500. Now, in today's value, that probably be around a million dollars to build something like that. That's why freestanding towers no longer exist. And the station was put on the air by a gentleman out of the Pittsburgh area uh, by the name of Kenneth Rennekamp. And that's how the KR got into WKRZ. And then uh, 1957 was the year that the first FM station came to Oil City and that was WDJR and that was for his daughter, Deborah Jo Rennekamp. So Oil City had the first AM station and then the first FM station as well. When the station first got on the air, uh, they were an NBC affiliate, as I had mentioned, and a lot of the programming that they would do would be directly from NBC. However, they did have local programs. Obviously, they had the news, and they would um, uh, play local uh, recordings of artists in the area and of course they played you know regular albums at that time I don't believe the 45 came into existence when they were on the air yet but there were these huge I mean really huge records vinyl records 
and a lot of the programs that would air were played off these, I think they were 16 inch vinyl recordings and they had a lot of special features. Some of them would last maybe up to a half of an hour. And they would also have local church programs. They would invite artists in. They had a huge piano in this one room and several microphone outlets. So they would have groups come in and they could play whatever type of music they played. A lot of it was country, gospel and everything. They also had the area's first radio talk show which was on the air in the evenings. It was called, What Do the People Think? And people were invited to call in and they could voice their opinions on anything that was happening in the community. I think radio has always been a vital part uh, of the community, any community. Uh, people were so excited from what I learned to have their own radio station because they could hear the local news. Uh, they knew that um, anything that was going on in the community would be reported in one way or the other. And even after WKRZ was um, sold, uh, that tradition continued because it was transferred, the license and everything, in 1977, February of 1977, to um, Robert and Jean Chapala out of Erie. The call letters were changed at the time to WOYL and WRJS, but that that continuation of local programming continued and still continues to this day. My name is Kathy Bailey. I am the Main Street Manager for the Oil City Main Street Program, and I'd like to talk to you about the Main Street Program and downtown Oil City. Our program follows the Main Street four-point approach which was developed by the National Trust for Historic Preservation that began in the 1980s. And it began to assist core communities that started to lose ground over time. Many core downtowns began to lose population and uh, employment, et cetera, when people started moving out to the suburbs. And that followed the invention of the automobile, the mass production of the automobile, the GI Bill, uh, that enabled people to move out to the suburbs. And so in probably 2008, 2009, is when some of our volunteers got together and began to form a way to, to create a Main Street program here in Oil City. Our program received designation in 2010, and one of the interesting stories about it is how the announcement was made, um, that it, it got the achievement of receiving that designation. Our volunteers closed down the Veterans Bridge for a short period of time to make that public announcement, but it caused quite a stir downtown. But that was one of the ways that we wanted to literally bridge the gap and, and bridge the two sides of town together by making that statement on the bridge. We have a very large number of projects on our plate right now, and some of them are very simple and some of them are a little more complex. One of the things that we work on is beautification, um, we work on promoting the district. We also work on trying to organize things and pull things together and um, finding new businesses and new uses for, for underutilized buildings. Our, we, we have committees that follow the four-point approach and that four-point ap approach includes design, organization, promotion, economic restructuring, and also we do safe, clean, and green too, which keeps the district green and clean. So our projects range from planting projects. We plant flowers in portable planters and we place them along sidewalks and streets in Oil City. Uh, we do that every spring. Uh, we have a group of volunteers that comes out, plants the pots, places them, we haul them around town, you know, put them out, and then we bring them in in the fall also. So we do those fall cleanup projects too. We have an adopt a block program where we're encouraging groups and businesses and even individuals to adopt different areas downtown and just to do cleanup projects, maybe sweep off sidewalks, um, pick up litter, pick up cigarette butts, um, all of those things to just keep the district clean and neat. Our design committee has also created a best dressed windows contest and that's something that's really created a lot of buzz. 
we have encouraged people to create window displays where there really weren't a whole lot of window displays before this started. And that's something that helps to create interest and make the district more walkable. If there is something interesting to walk by, people don't mind walking around. We started the program in the fall of 2013 with a workshop on how to create window displays. And from that, we, it, it, the program really just took off. So we have, in addition to retail stores, creating window displays. We have a lot of service-based business that are non-retail, but yet they're creating these great window displays. And some of them are of department store quality. It's really been an interesting program and it's created a lot of buzz and excitement in the district. Um, two of our big events are Oil City's Christmas Past and the Jingle Bell Run 5K. We work in conjunction with the Community Development Department of Oil City for Oil City's Christmas Past, and that includes a number of holiday festivals across town over a four-day period. Our Jingle Bell 5K is put on by the Main Street Program, and that is a 5K that is now run through downtown. We started this on Justice Trail a few years back, and we've slowly been able to move it into the district over time. And so it's exciting that that 5K is run through downtown. Um, it's held the first weekend of December every year. The Oil City Main Street program is important because it helps to make the district more, more vibrant. What we try to do is not only increase the awareness of the district, um, improve the appearance of the district, um, help to market it. It just, we want to create a more inviting atmosphere and um, vibrant atmosphere. We work in conjunction with the city, with the Oil, Re Oil Region Alliance, with our arts revitalization program. All of those things in tandem you know, work together to, to make it a, a better environment. And when you, are, when you have a, a downtown that's vibrant and exciting, that spreads out to the other areas of town too. Hi, my name's Hannah Plowman. I'm 12 years old, and my story is on the Oil City YMCA. I have been going since I was six months old. I probably took swim lessons from the time I was six months to probably the time I was probably five or six. The preschool at the Y it was fun. We, I remember from that we sang a lot. When I was in preschool at the Y, I made a lot of friends and I still know a couple to this day. When I was in fifth grade, I went to the Y from on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. But then when I went from kindergarten through third grade, I went, um, I went on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Probably my favorite activities to do at the YMCA are probably, I like, the sw I like to swim, and then I also do gymnastics at the Y, and that is also very fun. I am on the gymnastics team. I'm a two, probably by next year I'll be a three, and this summer I'll be going to nationals with my team, which we are going to camp. The, I, most of the girls that are going are younger girls. There's only one girl that's a level eight that's going. And her name is Cassie. And then there's a level two that's in my level. Her name's Nisa. And then the other people that are going are Maddie, um, Jenna, um, Alea, and Riley. I just have so much fun. With my team, they're like my friends, and I remember at one meet, I got first place, and they were all very happy about that. Probably the thing the kids like most about the Y is probably all the many sports that they do, like seasonal. Like, I know they do soccer. I never did any of the sports through the Y, except for gymnastics but well they I know they do soccer and um, they do for the little for little kids they do t-ball they do basketball and they do swimming and gymnastics the Y is probably my favorite place I go there a lot I go there for practice and sometimes I just like to go for fun. my favorite thing about living in oil city 
is my probably all of my close friends live in my neighborhood so we get together probably about every day in the summer and then whatever days everyone's free like in the springtime we um we do a lot of stuff around town like we'll just run around our neighborhoods <laughs> and just do fun stuff like like we'll like r ride bikes down the hill you know just typical kid things Um, my name's Ron Gustafson, and I'm a, a, a currently an Oil City Councilman, a lifelong resident of Oil City, and uh, I wanted to talk to you about our town square, which is nearby here where we're filming. It's kind of opened up the middle of our town. Uh, it addressed a large, blighted block of buildings that had been basically abandoned by their owner and uh, was becoming a real detriment to Oil City. It was moldy, uh, crumbling, the roof had caved in, uh, so forth. So. Back in 2010, I, at that point, I was chairman of our redevelopment authority, and we were just newly reorganized at the time. We had really no assets whatsoever, but uh, around the corner from this building is our county economic development agency. It's the Oil Region Alliance, and they had been bringing people in to Venango County, uh, trying to entice business and grow business in Venango County. Unfortunately, everybody that they brought into the county, where they were bringing by this large blighted block we called the Brody Block. Uh, it had an old clothing store that was famous. It was the Brody Store. And Mr. Brody ended up over the years acquiring the entire block. But probably 1990, he sold it to some out of, you know, out of state investors who basically did nothing with it. You know, it had tenants. As the roofs leaked, the tenants left, you know, and then there was, like so many buildings, I guess, without tenants, without income, without any interest from the owners, it just got to be in a very dilapidated state. The Alliance approached us, the new fledgling Oil City Redevelopment Authority, and said that we need to do something with this, you know, it's really hampering our efforts, and they offered to partner with us. Uh, they assisted us with at first, $20,000 towards an asbestos and hazardous material study. It's something that you have to do with any commercial building. You have to go through those steps, you know, the environmental process. And they hired a firm to do an analysis of and locate all the asbestos. And we did that, or they did that, with the permission of the owner at the time because we had been able to negotiate a sales agreement with that owner, you know. Um, but during that process and after that engineering study had gone and before we had closed on the building, we had uh, discovered people ripping copper pipes out of the building, a roof had collapsed and the rest of our authority board got a little squeamish on the thing and we backed out. Probably a mistake at that point. But uh, So the owner who we had the agreement with was pretty upset about that, but he, so he flipped it up on eBay and it sold twi like twice in a couple, probably in a four or five days it sold twice. And uh, ended up in the hands of a physician in Florida. And he, he wanted to, he saw the nice picture on eBay and he wanted to make an assisted living center out of the entire block. But uh, there, you know, it was in be behind in taxes, it was headed for tax sale. And as the owner, the county notified him of the tax sale and whatnot, and he, he started to make contact up here about what he could do about it. Our code office in Oil City filled him in on the uh, advanced state of decay, and in the end, he donated the building, you know. So it was looking like the city was gonna have to step in and just take care of this. But people started to step up. Uh, local businesses started making contributions towards the, the demolition. The local chari charitable trust, uh, the Phillips Trust, stepped up with $40,000, uh, and people started to pay, take notice. They look, you know, people are rallying around this. They want this taken care of. With, in the midst of all these contributions, local contractors who did demolition work st started to step up, and, and a very good firm in Oil City made a, a most generous offer. You know, when they, they did the engineering study, they predicted that it would be about $488,000, nearly a half a million dollar project. We had a local firm uh, offer to remove the building and fill the site for less than 150. And that was within our means then, you know, and then more contributions came in, so we were able to pull it off, you know. But as the building came down, and I was down, they did it at night, you know, and it was quite a spectacle. They had large lights and 
whatnot, and people were gathering like it was a big event, watched the building come down. As it came down and they filled the site, I looked and I was like, oh my, look at this. This is like a whole new town. You know, we, we're in the transit buildings now. It's a beautiful historic building. Suddenly you can see it in its full glory, you know, across the town square. The neighboring bank building, we have high hopes for that, but it's architecturally a beautiful building. And uh, suddenly it has a new face. That building in next over town, or next door, the bank building, had never been seen that way before because it was newer than the Brody block, you know, so that we'd never had that viewpoint of it. And hopefully that'll give that building some life and it's certainly done good for this building and we hope, you know, the other buildings around. Hello. I'm Robin Moon and I'm here today to talk about the Oil City Gardens. When I was a child, uh, we came into town about once a week into Oil City to do our shopping and I always looked forward to coming to town because I got to see the memorial fountain that's at the East End. Um, since I've grown up, I've learned that that fountain was put in place there by the works of the Oil City Garden Club. They fundraised and built the fountain and it was dedicated on July 4th, 1962. As that fountain of 1962 got older, in 1990, they ended up fundraising throughout that time to build a new fountain and put it in place in 1990. At that time, they started to ramp up um, the plantings and the gardens around town more. They'd always planted around town, but at that time, they ramped it up to plant more and started other gardens planted down what we call the fishtail by the fountain. Then they went over where you drove to the grocery stores. They planted later on Wilson Avenue, which was just an ordinary V Street. And in the center of that were trees planted. And then they planted gardens in around that area. Then they moved on to the Oil City Library. And they, to this day, still take care of the library and Wilson Avenue. They quietly do it. They don't get accolades for it, but they, they quietly and steadily do the gardens around town. They plant gardens in the containers over town, um, down in Justice Park. There's containers down there along the river and in the parking lot that they plant. Uh, used to be they planted planters over at City Hall, but they've since changed that to day lilies that come up every year. The Garden Club were asked to help in the Hassan Park to add color to it. They studied and some of them got their master gardeners to do this work. Uh, the Garden Club actually worked from 1961 through 1968 propagating and planting the rhododendron the arboretum. The arboretum is a place where you can walk through and it's built like the Windsor Royal Gardens. So you can walk through it, there's a path, and you can see them in bloom, and there's over 25 species of rhododendron in the garden. In the early 90s, they placed a geodome in the arboretum that was right at the beginning of it that they won uh, through a garden club member that just entered a contest for it, and they won it, and they built it. It was made out of wood and was there for several years, now there's a seating area so you can set in the arboretum and just enjoy the rhododendrons. The funding comes from the Northwestern Pennsylvania Conservatory for some of it. And the manpower comes from the citizens of Oil City and Garden Club. I feel the gardens are important to Oil City and shows that we all work together to make our city a better place for all of us and for visitors who come to our city. Hi, I'm John Deemer, and I'm here to talk about the East End Fountain. I was, uh, picked my granddaughter up from some place and I was taking her past the fountain. She was three at the time. And uh, she noticed the fountain wasn't working. And she says to me, she goes, what, the fountain's not working, what's the matter with it? And I said, well, it must be broke. And we're sitting there at the stop sign and she says, well, can't you fix it? And I'm like, well, yeah, I probably could. She goes, well, then fix it. So I told her I would. So I called, uh, at the time it was um, uh, Butch Truett, city uh, director of public works. And uh, I said to Butch, I says, you know, what's wrong with the fountain? And he said, well, we're shutting it down because it's leaking too much water, it's not working. And so I said, um, can 
can I meet you there and we'll take a look at it and I'll see if I can't fix it. And he said, well, yeah, I can meet you there. I said, well, it's important because my granddaughter's counting on me fixing this thing. So, uh, so the next day we met and it was a Tuesday when we met and uh, I looked it over and I told Butch, I said, you know, I think I can, you know, get this up and running for at least one more year. And I said, uh, you know, when, you know, can I try? And he said, yeah, you got two days. And I'm like, what do you mean I got two days? He said, council meeting's Thursday night. And he says, and they're going to uh, have us tear it down. He says, and just level the whole thing up. And I said, nothing like pressuring me to, you know, to do this. So I said, you know what, I, you know, I'll try it. So I went over. And I told him that, you know, that basically it's shot. I mean, it was never built to be outside to start with. Um, it had replaced a fountain that was there, built in 1962 out of stone. This one was fiberglass. And so I went to council, gave him a report, and I said, you know, I don't know what your intentions are moving forward, but um, I do a lot of volunteerism in the area and I haven't done anything for a while. So I said, I'd like to raise the money, design the fountain, and build it. And, uh, and they agreed to it. They, uh, they didn't made a motion that night, formed a task force, and then just said, it's all yours. We don't want nothing to do with it. Um, so we put this committee together, and then a subcommittee of about 20 people. So at this point, we had 30 people uh, starting on this project. So I researched companies that had built fountains and I came up with one called Flare Fountains. They're out of Minnesota. And uh, so I called them. And um, it just so happens it was late at night and they're an hour behind us. And the owner of the company answered. And I got to talking to him, what was going on. And we, we clicked. I couldn't get anybody else to respond. They were all busy. Uh, this company's around 50 years. So in talking with them, I, I researched them more. They, they built a 9-11 memorial fountain. And so I thought, wow, this is a small town, but they, they treated us just like, you know. So, and I like the idea that they had the expertise that they're doing, you know, the largest, you know, public fountain there is. So over the next two and a half years, this committee stuck together. We met at my office every Wednesday night, almost every Wednesday night and you know triggered to figure out fundraising how to do this the awareness and what have you knowing that we were never going to get any money from the city so uh, we started out um, fairly slow but it started to build so it took two and a half years but we had literally people from all over the country send us money five dollars ten dollars fifteen dollars people that had lived here that i've known and and done work with and they heard about it and they were sending money. So it slowly uh, came in. And then I started pressuring the trades in the area and suppliers uh, to donate. And so a lot of the local contractors stepped up to help uh, and donate their time. So in-kind service helped. We had in-kind service of approximately $70,000 of that total figure. So that helped. But uh, in the end, we ended up with a fountain that is uh, built to withstand for 100 years. Literally, it will stand there for 100 years. And we made it as green as we could possibly. You know, we used LED lights. Uh, I designed a control panel that they built that um, you can monitor with a laptop. And it has wind sensors, because where it's located, when the wind would kick up, it would blow out over the highway. So the city always had to turn it down and leave it down. So we, you know, we just kind of put a lot of things in there. We can make the water dance, uh, and we can change the LED lights. If it, Crayola has a color, we can make those lights that color. Uh, like cancer awareness, we did pink and things like that. So, you know, we put this together. Um, we're working on a, an endowment now to maintain it, and uh, we, uh, we have about 5,000 in that. We have a fundraiser tonight that we're doing for it. Uh, and we're gonna keep doing that till we raise $40,000 to uh, make this endowment so that the city never has to worry.
born in the surrounding areas of Wall City and always lived here. Uh, it's just a wonderful place. The, the natural setting is great for hunting, fishing, biking, um, uh, and it's a great place to raise your kids. My favorite thing about Oil City, it is a wonderful place to raise children. Uh, it's, it's beautiful, it's clean, it's safe, it's friendly. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of recreational opportunities. What I love about Oil City is the scenery, the, uh, the history, and just really nice people. My favorite thing has always been my students. Well, I like, the, I like small town atmosphere. I love the small town community. What do I love about Oil City? I like the rural atmosphere and all of the nature that surrounds the town. And I like the fact that it's an artist community. My favorite thing about Oil City is the historic architecture. I enjoy most of all the beautiful homes, the big, beautiful old homes that we have in Oil City. The availability of nature. We can go out our door right into a state park. In a, lot of, in a lot of the areas around here, we have hills and trails and the river provides a lot of fun. I would have to say uh, the four seasons. Um, this winter was a little rough, but uh, I still, I think I like the four seasons. Small towns have a lot of character and I found that there's a lot of interesting people to talk to and you can still do big city projects and big city ideas, you can have those in a small town and it can have just as much of an impact. My favorite thing about living in Oil City is that it's a beautiful area. Um, lots of mountains, lots of things to do recreationally. The people though are the big draw here. You don't have quite the same people experience as you do here when everybody knows everybody else. It's a, a community that everybody pretty much knows your name. As you can see, we're a close-knit group. Uh, you can walk in somewhere and know somebody and you get a hug. There are so many kind and wonderful people uh, here uh, who, who like to get involved in all of the community activities and everything. And the involvement is growing stronger all the time. It's, yes, I will help you, I will help you. They don't hesitate as much. I mean, it's just, the closeness, the, the knit that the town is coming back to. Everybody just wants to work together and show that we are a community, that we've, we've had our struggles. We were the corporate headquarters for Quaker State, Wolf's Head, and Pennzoil, and those companies all moved out. And even though we've struggled, we're still here, we're still surviving to tell our story. So many things that changed the world happened in this valley between Titusville and Oil City. I mean, truly, th monumental things happened here with U.S. Steel and Penn's Oil, et cetera. And we here in Oil City are very proud and are disappointed maybe that things have shifted differently, but we're not going to uh, allow that to, you know, board up the town, so to speak. You know, the history is, it's, it's good that it's being continued to be passed on to each generation wonderful thing. I do this because it's a passion of mine. It is part of me. I live here. It's important to stay here. I raised my daughter here. I have friends that are still here and it's it's our town. This is our town and we're not going to let it die off. We're here to have the young people be able to support them, help them grow because they're going to be taken over when we're not here. So we want to support them and we want to make sure our town is always known. This is Oil City. Our town, Oil City, is brought to you by Moonlight Packaging in Oil City, manufacturer of structural corrugated containers, sheets, interior packaging, partitions, and custom packaging supplies since 2007. Providing assistance from design to prototype and manufacturing to delivery, Moonlight Packaging focuses on customer service with a team approach to problem solving and versatility in protecting product. Moonlight Packaging, proud to support the Oil City community and WQLN Public Media. 
Gates and Burns Realty, helping people buy, sell, and rent homes for over 125 years with offices located in Oil City, Franklin, and Clarion. Home listings, commercial properties, and additional services are available at GatesandBurnsRealEstate.com. Gates and Burns Realty, serving the oil region since 1889. Venango College of Clarion University, nestled in the historic Oil Valley region, is committed to providing students with an educational experience that allows for individualized services and support. Venango College of Clarion University grants two-year, standalone, and associate degrees in 11 academic disciplines. The college also offers select baccalaureate and master's degrees and provides students an opportunity to begin any of Clarion University's 90-plus bachelor's degree programs. Information's online at Clarion. Edu. Days in Oil City Conference Center, located on the banks of the Allegheny River in historic downtown Oil City, Pennsylvania at 1 Seneca Street. Information about the conference space, banquet hall, and other amenities is available at daysin.com 814-677-1221. Additional support provided by The Sir Family, Art Inside, H&R Block, Cranberry Mall, In Memory of Polly and Lee Forker, Oil City Civic Center, sponsorship provided in part by Martin J. Farrell, and viewers like you. Thank you.